my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar today it's our 259 international physics webinar and today we have with us uh, dr jian philip boucher professor department of physics equally normally funds and uh, also chairman and head of research capital fund management and he will talk on economic crisis a physicist point of view i think you will enjoy it and you can also join us using the team link i'll send the, the link in in the comment section and you can also ask question by commenting in facebook and youtube so please uh, join with us and thanks for supporting so it's your time you can start your session okay so can i go ahead yes you can Uh, I am happy to speak about the subject that's been on my um, research agenda for many years now. Um, so uh, a physicist's point of view on economic crisis. So I'm, I'm a physicist by training and I've been working in physics for many years and I still am uh, when I have time. But uh, more and more I became interested in economic and financial problems, uh, both from a professional and academic point of view. And so I, I'd like to tell you a story that's been building up over uh, well, several years now with uh, many colleagues and, and collaborators. And if you are looking for the corresponding papers, uh, you'll see uh, by uh, going to Google, Google Scholar, um, uh, the corresponding papers. But if you're interested, you can also email me and I'll point you towards the uh, relevant references. So anyway, um, the, the first observation that is uh, puzzling and interesting is that if you look at um, financial markets or e economy as a whole, uh, what you find is that there's a lot of crises uh, that uh, appear to be without plausible causes. So for example, if you look at this graph here on the left, it's the crash of 1929. Um, and uh, Many of these crashes, 1929, 1987, 1962, less well known, there's a flash crash in 2010, um, and many other smaller ones um, happened without uh, plausible cause. So that's been noticed already a long time ago by three economists, Cutler, Potterman, and Summers. Um, so of course, sometimes uh, financial markets do crash for a reason. Uh, like like COVID, for example, uh, but um, many times, uh, surprisingly, there's nothing much happening and still uh, markets crash. So it seems that financial markets are intrinsically unstable and only partially reflect the underlying economic fundamentals. And that's the, the, the common law in economic theory is that financial prices are in a way slaved to economic fundamentals. So if nothing happens, fundamentals, the prices, the price shouldn't uh, jump at all, actually. And something similar happens, actually, for um, a, 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 a system-wide uh, economic crisis. So, for example, 2008, the big crisis of 2008, is still not very clear what caused it. Um, people debate, but there's no, there's no big event. I mean, people... Uh, speak about the subprime prices, but actually it, it is a small cause that had uh, a very big effect on the economy, and that shouldn't be the case. But even if you don't look at crisis, uh, but just the yearly fluctuations of the GDP growth year on year, what you find, for example, in the US since the 50s is that the average GDP growth is around 3% per year, but plus or minus 3%. So there are huge fluctuations that are hard to understand uh, for such a large economy uh, as, uh, as the one of the US. So the economy as financial markets seems to be prone to endogenous agitation. Um, but the problem is that from a theoretical point of view, I mean, the, the, the standard um, economic law is that rationality of economic agents uh, should lead to financial markets that are efficient, uh, 
I mentioned that already, prices are always very close to fundamental value. And economies should fluctuate around a unique optimal equilibrium, uh, but it should only be moved by exogenous shocks. By exogenous shocks, one has in mind, for example, technology shocks or disasters or the COVID that, that struck last year. This is a clear cause that indeed has a tremendous effect on economies. But if you look at the number I gave you, 3% plus or minus 3%, a lot of these fluctuations seem to come out of uh, nowhere. This was called the, the small shock large business cycle puzzle by Ben Bernanke. And it is a puzzle because small shocks should lead to small fluctuations. What economists call uh, business cycle is actually the fluctuations of the year on year GDP. So if you want, uh, that's a little picture that I've show, shown here of a, a marble in a bowl. This is, this is a standard picture of uh, the economy in classical models. Um, there's a unique equilibrium, which is at the bottom of the bowl. And, and only by moving the ball around should the, the marble itself uh, fluctuate. But if nothing happens, uh, the marble should uh, s s stand uh, still at the bottom of the, of the ball. Okay, a few quotes here uh, from uh, famous people, famous economists. So for example, uh, some economists like Eugene Fama, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2013, said in 2010 uh, about financial prices, he said, prices in 2008 started to decline in advance of when people recognized there was a recession. That's exactly what you would expect if markets were efficient. So you see, in this logic, it's not because financial markets um, had a problem that the recession started, it's actually because people somehow anticipated there was going to be an economic recession based on what nobody knows, that miraculously uh, financial prices adjusted to reflect uh, the recession to come. So I find it uh, very implausible, but you see uh, some people still believe in the efficiency of markets, including Nobel Prizes in economics. Another Nobel Prize in economics, uh, Robert Lucas in 2003, said uh, about macroeconomic theory macroeconomics has succeeded, the central problem of depression prevention has been solved for all practical purposes. And um, of course, everybody knows what happened in 2008, which was a, a clear rebuke of this st statement. Uh, but Robert Lucas, the same, in uh, a year after the um, uh, start of the crisis, said, well, the 2008 crisis was not predicted because economic theory predicts that such events cannot be predicted. Um, I find it very bizarre that one could defend economic theory based on, on such uh, an argument. Uh, but if you are a strict uh, orthodox, then indeed this is true. Because uh, as I said, economic systems as financial markets should only move because of exogenous, unpredictable events. And therefore, if you believe that the theory is right, um, then you should be led to the conclusion that you cannot predict crisis. But I think this falls very uh, short of being uh, an acceptable, satisfactory theory of the world, because there's a lot of things that can happen that are not included in standard economic theory, and I'm absolutely certain that we can do better. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to predict exactly when crisis and all crises will happen, but I think that between the world that economists have, have uh, created, the theoretical world that economists have created, and the real world, there's a lot to be uh, on and, and bridge and I'll, I'll that later. So again, on the 2008 crisis, Barack Obama said um, in January 2009, when he gave his inaugural address to the nation, he said, our workers are no less productive than when this crisis began. Our minds are no less inventive, our goods are, and services no less needed than they were last week. So what Barack Obama says is that what happened? You know, nothing material was destroyed, and yet suddenly the world has, is not the same. And so here we're starting to feel that there's something collective, there's something related to 
trust to the way human beings collectively um, create uh, the world that they live in, which is at stake here. And I'll speak about that from a physics point of view in a second. Also, um, from you know, as a kind of response to um, uh, Robert Lucas, Jean-Claude Trichet, who's head of the European, European Central Bank in 2010, reflecting on what happened in 2008, said, models failed to predict the crisis and seemed incapable of explaining what was happening. In the face of the crisis, we felt abandoned by conventional tools. So in this sentence, you read that economic theory is really used by central banks bankers to try to understand the world around them and therefore there's a, there's a real stake here of trying to improve uh, the way we think about uh, economic systems and the way we construct uh, prevention, uh, prevention tools or monetary or policy tools to react to these possible crises. Okay, so the main theme of my talk and what I believe um, physics can bring to the table is, is based on this um, uh, sentence of Bill Anderson, more is different, which is a very famous uh, philosophical pa paper in, in science in 1972, which is well known by many. Um, and the idea is that the collective is not the sum of individuals. So this may look like uh, you know something that everybody has heard about already, but I think that there are very precise ways to, to state this, uh, this idea that can have an impact in uh, social systems in general, but also, but, but of course, economic and, and financial markets in particular. So the idea is uh, of Phil Anderson that he expressed very clearly. He says the behavior of large assemblies of interacting individuals, and I highlight interacting because this is obviously the point here, and he says particles, and I replace particles by individuals. So the behavior of large assemblies of interacting individuals cannot be understood as a simple extrapolation of the properties of isolated individuals. Instead, entirely new anticipated behavior may appear, and their understanding requires new ideas and methods. And what you see here as an illustration is, okay, this is a, a, an amusing cartoon where you see these little fishes mimicking a big fish and, and uh, being able to, um, to freak out the, the real big fish here. But, you know, you, you, you have these um, uh, flock of birds here that are able to do incredible patterns in the sky whereas each individual bird is, is uh, actually flying pretty lousily. Uh, but as a whole, you, you see that there's a kind of super bird that appears and that is supposed to, um, uh, to, be, um, uh, to, to, to make an impression on, on predators. And here is a picture that actually should be a movie. Uh, this, these are um, thousands of flashing uh, fireflies that are able to flash in unison to synchronize themselves um, in a way actually neurons in our brain uh, do and, and obviously the behavior of the whole uh, cannot be understood uh, through the behavior of a single unit. A, a single neuron cannot think, cannot dream, cannot have consciousness. It's really a property of the whole that is completely different from uh, what happens at the individual level. And here I want to quote again um, the, the beginning of a book by Stephen Strogatz called uh, The Emerging Science of Spontaneous Order, where he reflects on these uh, five lines that I just mentioned. And, and I think that the, the whole story is, is quite interesting also from an epistemological point of view. He says, for 300 years, Western travelers to Southeast Asia had been returning with tales of enormous congregations of fireflies blinking on and off in unison. This place had stretched for miles along the rib banks. How could thousands of fireflies orchestrate their flashing so precisely and on such scales? For decades, no one could come up with a plausible theory. A few believe that there must be a maestro, a firefly that cues all the rest. Only by the late 60s did the pieces of the puzzle begin to fall into place. And so you see 
here at the yeah, International Ideas and Open Maestro, but actually there's no maestro. It's, it's collectively that these birds do what they do and these fireflies do what they do. Uh, um, but on the other hand, so that's sorry, so someone is uh, trying to enter the. Um, am I going to be able to do this? Um, sorry about this. I've heard someone wanting to enter the link. No, okay. So let me revert to my slides. Um, so there's no maestro, it's collectively that uh, the system is able to self-organize itself. And when Strogat says only by the late 60s did the pieces of the puzzle begin to fall into place, he actually refers to the fact that people actually started to, to, to ask the same questions about neural networks and, and start understanding from a mathematical point of view how such a, a spectacular collective effect can be modeled. Okay, here are a few human examples, uh, riots, um, the Mexican wave at stadium, and if you think about Mexican wave, this is an interesting example. Um, so, as you as you probably know, people start trying to stand up and try to initiate the, the wave that will propagate around the stadium. And um, clearly, it's a collective effect. Uh, many times, a group of people start to try to initiate such a, a wave and fail. And so, there must be a of critical nucleus, a critical size of people, of the group of people doing it to start the, 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 the motion of the wave. And if you think about it, what's non-trivial and what's common to other examples in physics of collective effect is that there's, there's broken symmetry in the sense that uh, the Mexican wave can propagate clockwise or counterclockwise a priori. And it decides to do so in a way that you know, breaks the symmetry and breaking the symmetry, as we are going to show a little later, is a signal of these uh, collective effects. So riots are also interesting to understand from that point of view. It's often it needs a, a quick critical mass of people, a tipping point, before riots uh, become um, important. And this was actually modeled by sociologists as well, along lines that physicists uh, would not uh, would, would actually recognize. So I, I try to give various examples of how collective can be very different from individuals. But what is striking and uh, puzzling, in a sense, is that uh, still now a lot of the models used in economics replace the collective by a unique, rational, so-called representative agent calculates her actions in her best, present, and future interests. So this representative agent, which is supposed to uh, condense in a unique um, person, a unique individual, uh, a crowd, is endowed with uh, magical uh, intellectual properties, able to solve very, very complex problem in an optimal manner and act accordingly. But as we know, the world is not at all uh, made of rational people. People are actually uh, you know, very heterogeneous, um, boundedly rational. Individually, we have a hard time as soon as the problem to solve becomes a little bit complex. We're also strongly interacting with one another, so we're influenced by one another. And as we just saw, this can lead to uh, very interesting and very surprising effects. And we live in a in a world that's extremely complex, uh, partly because we interact with that world and we shape that world by our action. And the world is, is non stationary. So even ideas like probability theory, um, the, the fact of replacing um, determinism by a probabilistic description, uh, is problematic when the properties themselves are not defined. And uh, so all this started to be a problem for theoretical economists already a long time ago, uh, but um, I want to in particular refer to 
a very nice paper by Alan Kerman in 1992, where he says, whom and what, that's the title of the paper, whom and what does the representative individual represent? So uh, there's been um, already uh, since the 90s, as is illustrated by the date of this paper, um, a trend towards trying to get rid of this representative agent um, paradigm. But um, I think it, we are very far from having uh, understood how uh, flawed this idea of a representative agent can be. And I'll give uh, several examples later on. So here again, the reason why I think physics has uh, something to bring to the table is that statistical physics in particular is a science of collective effects. And what we know is that emergent surprising collective effects stemming from uh, interacting with banal elementary units is, uh, is, is routinely observed. And, and one of the best known examples, but uh, often we, we forget the nearly miraculous nature of this transition is the, is the ice water transition at zero degree, the fact that the, a liquid becomes a solid. And so you see that as, as you change the temperature by a minute amount around zero degree Celsius, um, the water becomes ice, which is a solid uh, white material. And if you're at zero plus, it's uh, liquid and, and blue. So it's completely different at the macro level, whereas it is the same, very same molecules at the micro level. So, you know, we're very used to that. And so there's no question that we understand that it is the same molecules that are able to be in such different macro states. But I think for the layman, for the um, uh, uninformed public, it is still very strange that some such phenomenon uh, can, can, uh, can occur. It's, it's strange to think that it's not something happening at the micro level that has changed. And so these emerging properties that I call surprising, well, you can think of superconductivity, for example, the fact that collectively electrons can decide to flow together in a way that uh, is frictionless or uh, doesn't spend any energy is, I think, uh, a very spectacular um, uh, uh, realization of this, uh, of this idea that collective effects can be uh, extremely unanticipated. I mentioned the fact that memory and consciousness do not belong to any single neurons. Um, I, I spoke about bird flocks, fireflies, but of course, you know, in, in the case of uh, humans, panics, opinion shifts, crisis, all these things um, are clearly influenced by the fact that people see each other and um, in a sense act not only in pure, uh, in a purely rational way, but take into account what other people do for whatever reason they do it as, as an information and act also based on that information coming from others. So what is, I think, very important to understand is that uh, the, the going from the micro description to the macro description, you completely change uh, the results and the points of view. And this is, again, of course, related to more is different to the, the, the Phil Anderson's quote that I gave earlier, in the sense that you can have rational or irrational agents at the micro level and irrational or rational crowds at the macro level. So it's not enough to have rational agents to have, to have rational crowds. And you can have irrational agents that upon aggregation in the end lead to rational crowds. I mean, there's no connection between these two levels of description. And I think this is the major flaw of traditional economic models that need to be revisited. Okay, this is a, this is a funny quote from uh, Monty Python that I'm sure a lot of you have seen and, and know. Brian says, you don't need to follow me, you don't need to follow anybody. You've got to think for yourselves, you're all individuals. And the crowd says, yes, we're all individuals. And Brian says, you're all different. And the crowd answers, yes, we are all different. And the man in the crowd says, uh, I'm not, um, which I find a nice illustration of what I'm trying to say.
Anyway, in a, in a less uh, funny way, these crowds exist and can lead to indeed uh, spectacular and, uh, and terrible uh, phenomena. So for example, oh, I'm sorry, this is still in French, um, so I'm going to translate. So what I'm saying here is that a dense crowd, like the one that you see in Mecca here, can actually become a rigid elastic medium within which uh, uh, pressure will propagate. So in the case where individuals are sufficiently far from each other, the fact that you move doesn't really affect directly or weakly affects your neighbors. But when you're at close contact, when the crowd becomes extremely dense, then individuals disappear in the crowd in, in, a, in a real sense. That is that the, your motion is not due to your will, but is due to what other people are doing. And as people individually try to do things in a disordered way, these pressure waves can build up and actually can crush people and kill people. It's not really stampedes that kill people, it's these pressure waves that, uh, that lead to uh, suffocation. So here you have an extreme example of uh, what it means to go from the individual to the collective. There's, there's a, a new phenomenon, which is called the jamming transition in physics, where um, particles, when they start touching each other, they can create a solid, whereas when they are far away from each other, they are a liquid. And the little graph here actually is, is a measurement of these uh, pressure waves in the crowd, uh, constructed from camera views in, in Mecca. So more um, closer to, to physics, I think you know, when uh, example that everybody knows about our magnets, the fact that the, each spin tries to give an information to its neighbors that they should point in the same direction. And depending on temperature, on the strength of interaction, you can either, either have a, a collective behavior that's completely disordered, and so there's no nothing happening at the macro scale, or when interactions become stronger, temperature lower, then um, the orientation taken by all these spins become uh, coherent over the whole material and the object becomes a magnet. Um, so in this case, you recover the breaking of symmetry that I talked about. Um, at the low, in, the, in the low temperature phase, all these spins are going to point either up or down, but a priori they had to choose they had the choice between up and down, and it was completely equivalent. But because of a mere fluctuation, uh, the whole system decided to go one way or another. So coming back to what I was speaking about at the beginning of the talk, the fact that um, in economics, prices should be related to fundamentals, here you have an example of a very spectacular macroscopic phenomenon that is not related to fundamentals. There's nothing a priori selecting plus or minus or up or down, but still the system spontaneously in a self-consistent fashion decides to orient itself in one direction or another. And this example, now it's, it's a school of fish rather than, uh, than, than birds, but it's the same idea. You know, if, if, if I'm a, a fish and I fly or swim in the same direction as my neighbor, well, the problem is that the neighbors themselves orient themselves thanks thanks to partly thanks to, to what I'm doing. So you can have if the interaction is weak, a completely disordered uh, school of fish, and if interaction is sufficiently large, then the spontaneous direction that all school of fish chooses to go to, so the, the, the direction in which the whole fish school orients itself. But again there's no particular reason why this direction should be chosen over any other one. It's a, it's a spontaneous uh, phenomenon that appears somewhat at random, but the fact is that it becomes collective and macroscopic. And what's interesting is that there's a special critical point that, it, that, that separates two phases, a critical point or a critical line, like in this uh, famous phase diagram of uh, usual bodies, uh, where 
whereas in the solid phase or in the liquid phase, in the gas phase, nothing much happens. But close to these boundary conditions, oh, sorry, not boundary conditions, close to these boundaries, then there, there can be uh, discontinuous events taking place even when the pressure or the temperature is only slightly changed. And I gave that example before uh, liquid water becoming uh, ice. So the fact is that we're all social animals. Here is a quote by Poincaré, which I left in French, but on purpose this time, because, uh, because Henri Poincaré was, was, of course, French. And Poincaré noticed the following. He said that when men come close together, they don't decide randomly and independently from one another. They react on one another. Uh, multiple causes uh, come into play. They trouble men. They, uh, these causes uh, throw them right and left, but there's something that it survives all this, and it's there uh, is the fact that there are uh, annual sheep, that is, uh, sheep that will follow uh, one of them. So, this idea that uh, humans are probably not as rational as economists, the uh, economic theory wants them to be, and that uh, new effects can arise through this interaction is obviously a very old idea. The, 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 the only problem is, of course, to make these ideas into something uh, tangible from a theoretical point of view. And here I give several examples of this uh, human vector behavior. Uh, so these are love locks on the Bridge of Paris that I used to cross when I was going to work. And what was really spectacular is that um, I was crossing these, this bridge every day, it's called Pont des Arts in Paris, and you know, in, in a matter of a uh, few weeks only, uh, there was uh, at the beginning only a few of these love locks, and after maybe three or four weeks, the whole bridge was covered with them, which you know, illustrates the strength of this uh, imitation force, this copycat force that, that tends to um, orient our, our actions. This is a graph of the number of uh, surnames in Stephanie that were given uh, in France uh, between 1900 and 2010. And uh, well, there's a Princess Stephanie of Monaco, is the little girl that you see that you see here, that was born in 1965. And then suddenly everybody um, wanted to call, uh, oh, well, not everybody, but there was at, at the peak 23,000 uh, Stephanie in the same year in 1973 or something. This is a picture of a background. And this is a picture, of, I mean, it would take a little time to explain exactly what I'm graphing here, but the, the red line here is called the head spread. It's the difference between the interbank lending rate, overnight lending rate, and, and the, the state rate, the safe rate, if you want. And so if this is low, it means that banks uh, trust themselves, and if it goes high, it means that banks uh, don't trust themselves and, and don't want to lend to each other. Um, and what you see is that in, in 2008, what happened is that suddenly this, this kind of uh, gauge of mistrust gauge uh, shot up uh, very brutally in a matter of, uh, of a day or two after Lehman's uh, demise, actually. And this, this was really a kind of uh, collective loss of confidence. And uh, in the same way as I explained that I fly in a certain direction because you fly in a certain direction, here it's really I, I've lost trust because you've lost trust because I've lost trust. And uh, although there's an initial uh, uh, event that creates this loss of crisis, if you think about the real reason, uh, there was no objective reason why uh, the financial crisis of 2008 uh, should have been so intense, but it did so because of this propagation of uh, confidence loss. These are other examples of spectacular, spectacular effects that uh, confidence loss can um, uh, impose on, on society. For example, hyperinflation. This is a real bank note, actually, of uh, $100 trillion uh, 
by the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. And this is the history of the, of the great inflation in, in Germany. So as soon as uh, you know, people lose trust on the value of money, then um, hell can break loose and, uh, and, and you know, terrible things can happen. So how to go beyond uh, the traditional models where uh, rational agents and rational agents and, and single representative agents uh, well one route is to embrace the complexity of the world by simulating so of course simulation is well known in physics but it's not yet so well accepted in uh, economic quarters and, and so this is i think a fight that the physicists are well positioned to uh, to, to win and of course you know things are progressing this direction already, but there's still a lot of, to be done in, in that direction. So I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit with an example what uh, simulation can bring to, to the table. And before doing that, um, I'm quoting here uh, um, an op-ed by Mark Buchanan in the New York Times in October 2008, where it was called "This Economy Doesn't Does Not Compute," and he was trying to advocate the use. Uh, more numerical simulations in economic theory and he was saying something that I think physicists are well aware of but uh, again that needs to be propagated in, in the economic uh, literature he said done properly computer simulation represents a kind of telescope for the mind multiplying humor, human powers of analysis and insight just as the telescope does our power of vision with simulations we can discover relationships that the unaided human mind, or even the human mind aided by the best mathematical analysis, would never browse. And so here, the idea is, is again that of, of these collective effects that can emerge from these simple rules, but that are sometimes beyond imagination. If you think again about my example of superconductivity, nobody had, could have thought about such a, a spectacular effect before its experimental discovery. And the point of numerical simulation is that it can play the role of uh, experiments. You can experiment with numerical simulation and discover phenomena that your imagination wouldn't have been able to uh, discover. And so here I'm, I'm showing two black swans because this is the theme of the, of the black swan uh, paradigm of Nassim Taleb, things that uh, exist but that uh, unable uh, to imagine. So simulation, as probably a lot of you know, is, is well known and, and used in, in physics, and we simulate with uh, molecules uh, complex behavior. So what I'm showing here is actually this counterintuitive effect uh, that is again related to the problem of crowds in Mecca, that by blocking an issue, uh, an issue here, uh, blocking a door, you can, um, an exit, sorry. By blocking this exit, you can actually improve the flow out of, out of the room. And so the problem is that when uh, too many people try to exit the same, by the same room, then there's this jamming phenomenon that I talked about earlier that means that the flow is actually extremely weak. But if you try to organize the flow by, by blocking the, the exit, blocking not entirely, but making, forcing people to go around the, this, this, this round column and organize the flow, then you actually increase the flow compared to the situation without, um, without a, a, an obstacle. And so this is very counterintuitive but this is something that you can discover using numerical simulations, for example. And this is the solution that is actually now implemented in, uh, in Mecca. But this is, of course, one example out of many other examples that where uh, by using um, agent-based simulations, that is uh, simulation based on individual units that follow simple rules, you can see this uh, emerging complexity here and, uh, and and this forces you to think about the unexpected. So um, 
so as I said, this is, uh, this is well known in physics, but it's probably not as well known uh, in economics. And let me give you a few examples of, uh, of these collective phenomena that can appear. So let me first start with um, the model that was invented by Thomas Schelling, who was the actually also got the Nobel Prize in economics and, and was, I think, the first economist to think about these collective effects a long time ago. And it's uh, strange in a sense that uh, there's, it didn't have uh, more impact on, on his own community. So his model was uh, devised to try to understand why there's racial segregation in some uh, US cities. Whereas individually, people are not that uh, intolerant. Uh, people are actually okay to live in neighborhoods where they are not in minority. They, they, they are even okay to be 50-50 in the same neighborhood. But still, with time, um, neighborhoods become more and more segregated, either racially or socially. And so he came up with this very simple model. And what the, the version of the model I'm going to explain is, is not exactly his model. But it's a, it, it's a it's a slightly amended version of the model that uh, was proposed by these uh, physicists here, Grover, Bertin, Lemoyne, and Jensen, a few years back. So in this case, you think about the city as a collection of uh, neighborhoods. So each square here is a neighborhood, and each agent has um, a utility function, a satisfaction that depends on the local density of the neighborhood he or she lives in. And the idea, you know, the analog of this uh, tolerance effect that I talked about a few sentences ago is to say that people actually would prefer to live in neighborhoods that are half filled. So they don't want to live in neighborhoods that are empty because they're alone, there's no, uh, there's no shop, no cinemas, no bars. Uh, but they don't want to live in a neighborhood that's too crowded either because um, otherwise you know, the, the trouble coming from crowdedness, difficulty to park, whatever, becomes uh, a bother. So in the model, you can assume that the, this utility function depends on the local density and has a shape like this, but it could also be a parabola, it doesn't really matter. It's just a function that is maximum at 0.5. And so now you endow each agent with a rule, which is that each agent may decide to move neighborhood. And if he finds that the neighborhood that he's been visiting recently has a better utility for himself, that is a density closer to one half than the one he's actually living in right now, then he decides to move to this new neighborhood. But doing this, he doesn't take into account the fact that while by leaving, he's going to change the neighborhood, the, the density of the neighborhood uh, in which, towards which he's moving to, and he's going to change the density of the neighborhood he's leaving. So he doesn't take into account the utility of, of others in this choice. And and the, the, the su surprising thing, the, the, one of the surprises that you understand when you do a numerical simulation of the model, is that actually you end up in a situation like situation B here, which is that some neighborhoods are actually becoming completely empty and other neighborhoods are uh, at a density which is above uh, one half. Actually, the, the density of these neighborhoods in the model is uh, square root of two over two when M is zero. So um, when you have a perfectly symmetric utility function, this is uh, square root of two over two is the local density. But you see that this is not at all satisfactory for people because they would all prefer to live in that kind of well-mixed neighborhood and they actually live in segregated neighborhoods. So it really is an, it's a case where the um, Adam Smith invisible hand badly fails. As, as you probably remember, Adam Smith uh, says that it's, it's because people follow individually their own interests that uh, collectively we get our bread each morning and so on and so forth but in this case people follow their own utility uh, in a kind of selfish way but the um, end game of, of this repeated 
is uh, a situation that is uh, satisfactory for nobody. And so from a mathematical point of view, what's nice about the paper of these guys is that you can actually analyze the model completely and find that mathematics that is very close to the liquid gas uh, transition. And what they also uh, explain is that if you add a kind of tax um, that in a sense penalizes the moves that adversely, adversely affect others, then you help the system reaching uh, collectively uh, satisfactory states. So it's, it's an interesting case where you can also discuss the role of taxation in order to make uh, the collective behave in a way that they wouldn't do otherwise. So this was a, a very simple model, arguably the first agent-based model in economics. And actually, you know, when you read the Schelling's papers, he, he, he was actually doing, doing some kind of uh, simulation using uh, coins to illustrate uh, this effect in, during the seminars. So he's actually, he was actually simulating uh, rather than solving it. Um, but we're still very far from uh, macroeconomics, so <coughs> I want to tell you about the nation-based model for uh, uh, the macroeconomy, which we worked on with uh, three other physicists, Stanislav Gualdi, Marco Tarsia, and Francesco Zampoli. Uh, so it's a model that we call Mark Zero, because uh, in a sense it's, uh, well, the name is it's not well chosen, it's a historical reason. The zero means that it's really a kind of zeroth uh, order attempt to, to do this. So it's not the only model, in, uh, not the only agent-based model for uh, macroeconomics, of course, but um, what we wanted to do was to create a, an agent-based model that's, that is sufficiently stylized so you understand exactly that some effects appear with rules that you can uh, understand and, and the mechanism of these effects can be pretty well understood. Some agent-based models are already so complex that in a sense they have many parameters and it's hard to keep track of what's going on in the model itself. So we try to, to devise a proof of concept agent-based model that illustrates how ideas from physics based diagrams of the robustness of behavior against changes of microscopic rules uh, or things like that could actually be translated into more uh, economic uh, situation. So, as I said, the, the agent-based models assume that individual agents uh, obey simple rules, and these rules are chosen to be plausible uh, from introspection, from what you believe your uh, human fellows are actually doing on, on an everyday basis. But of course, some of these rules can be described as ad hoc and are described as ad hoc in particular by purists in economic departments who would prefer to, to have our agents uh, solve uh, rational uh, optimization problems. But as I said, I think this is not the right starting point. Still, these uh, models have to uh, obey a, a certain number of constraints. Uh, so in physics, for example, you, if you simulate molecules, the first thing you should do is to be sure that you conserve energy uh, during the motion of each molecule. Uh, well, in the case of um, economic agent-based models, there are things that you should conserve. So for example, money cannot be created spontaneously except if you put a central bank that does so. Uh, so the Asian-based model is ad hoc in some way, but clearly satisfies some, some constraints that you want the model to, to satisfy. And actually, you know, coming back to what we know in physics, it's often these constraints, these simple constraints like symmetry or conservation of energy or conservation of magnetization that uh, select the type of behavior that you get on, uh, at the macro level. So anyway, so just in a, in a nutshell, because I see that time is uh, flying, uh, 
uh, in our ancient base model, we have farms, we have households, and the farms, they have to produce stuff. And so they have to adjust workforce, which in our case, we just choose production to be equal to workforce. Uh, whereas in more complicated settings, you would, in order to produce something, you need not only workforce, but also raw material and all sorts of things. But in our simple framework, workforce is really the same thing as production. So firms have to adjust workforce, prices, and possibly wages in reaction to sales. And so, for example, if they if they overproduced, then the next time round they're going to decide maybe to fire some of their workers or maybe to lower their price or both, and vice versa. And there's a very important parameter that's going to appear, so I put it in red here, which is the ratio between the speed at which firms hire uh, as a response to uh, demand being larger than supply or fire in the uh, opposite situation. So if firms react higher faster than they fire, if you want, then this ratio R is going to be greater than one. But if they overreact by firing people as soon as they overproduce, then this ratio is going to be lower than one. Households, well, households work, of course, but they also consume. And so the, the, the rule here is that they consume at each time step, they want to consume a certain fraction C of their savings. And while shopping around, they, they will try to choose firms with, uh, with lower prices. And then if you start running the model, you realize that firms make profits, but also make, uh, make losses. And so they very, quickly can run into debt, as is the case uh, also in real life. And what we do in the model is that we allow firms to get into debt up to a certain level. And this level is uh, parameterized by this letter M here, this red M, um, which is a multiple of total sales. And so if the debt of the firm is, um, say, uh, less than three times the total sales, one time the total sales, this is going to be a parameter, then banks allow the firm to uh, survive and keep its credit line open. But if the debt exceeds this uh, multiple M, then the bank uh, stops, sell, uh, stops um, lending and forces the firm to default. So there are defaults in the model. And when a firm defaults, uh, in order to prevent attrition of the economy, uh, we randomly replace uh, defaulted firms by new firms with a certain rate. I mean, it takes time for new firms to appear when one has uh, gone under. And so, for example, one of the uh, constraints that I was talking about earlier is when a firm defaults, its, it's debt doesn't disappear. It has to be... Um, shared between uh, households and surviving firms and that's what we do in order again not to have money uh, created out of nowhere and then we can also have a central bank that, that fixes the interest rate at which these uh, these debt must be uh, repaid so you see what i didn't mention is that we try to keep the model as simple as possible and here i'm highlighting three parameters, but um, the model in total has something like seven or 10. And it's very, very hard to reduce the number of parameters uh, substantially lower. But as you were going to see, actually these three parameters are uh, the most important ones in, the, to, in order to understand what's going on in, in the model. That's what I said here. Uh, there's a minimum of seven parameters, that's the least we could smallest we can do but some of these parameters turned out to be innocuous in the sense that you know, the, the, the fact of changing them doesn't change that much the uh, macro behavior where others are, are crucial and these are the ones that i mentioned of course the model is so simple that you know you can complain and able to you know, you're allowed to complain that we're missing a lot of things we don't have uh, 
as I mentioned, we don't have input goods. Uh, we know that firms create a network of input output. Uh, we have no markets. In real life, there's innovation and growth. Uh, so this is not meant to be taken uh, at face value. It should be taken as, as, a, as I said, as a proof of concept. But as you'll see, some robust features already emerge, and one of them is this idea of uh, robust phase diagrams. So as I've emphasized in physics, we're used to having the same phase diagram, uh, solid, liquid, gas, or all sorts of different bodies. It doesn't depend on the nature of the molecule. At the macro level, we have the same picture that appears. Of course, with phase boundaries that are not the same. I mean, water has a freezing transition at zero degrees Celsius, and this is not universal, but the shape, the overall topology of the phase diagram is the same. And this is the first thing that we wanted to check, and that's exactly what we find in this model, that you know, changing a lot of these uh, behavioral rules that I mentioned and parameters. So for example, we had a model where wages were fixed once and for all, and then we allowed the wages to be updated with the prices and production. But actually, in the end, it doesn't change the overall features that we see in the phase diagram. So what do we see? Here is a phase diagram drawn in the plane R, M. So remember, R is the ratio of hiring to firing adjustment rates. And M is the maximum level of indebtedness. And what we find is uh, actually four phases. One, uh, when R is, is less than one, that is, if uh, firms are firing too much, in a sense, uh, well, then the economy completely collapses because there's a, a kind of feedback loop that is created that firms uh, make people redundant. And so the budget of households goes down, and then you know, firms don't sell enough the next time around, then they fire more, and this ends up with uh, the rate of uh, unemployment of 100%. Of course, this is not realistic, but this is just within the model. So the graph on the right is the level of unemployment as a function of time in the simulation, and the color code is the same. So the black line here corresponds to the black phase here of collapse. Then there's a, a good phase where um, firms hire faster than they fire. And the level of indebtedness before failing is high. So you leave um, aiding firms uh, the chance of recovering. And this is good for the economy, again, this uh, in silico economy. And you reach full employment. So this is the blue line. Then there's a phase here, the red phase, where things are not so bad, but there's residual unemployment because you know, as soon as a firm gets a little bit too in depth, it's declared to be bankrupt. And so there's a lag between being bankrupt and the next firm uh, reviving and being able to hire uh, unemployed people. So there's a, a constant level of unemployment, which for this example is, is 20%, but don't bother too much about the absolute level of these numbers. And OK, so if you think about the mechanisms behind the, the, the model, it's pretty reasonable, except that you know it was not obvious to start with that, for example, this line uh, of uh, transition between a collapse phase and a full employment phase is a first order transition, as we call it in physics. Uh, but what really surprised us, and again, I'm trying to emphasize this idea that what is good about the numerical simulation is when you are surprised by the results you get is the presence of this uh, agreed phase, which we call the endogenous crisis phase, where surprisingly there's, uh, there are waves of unemployment, there are crises that come out of nowhere, and they come out of nowhere because in this fictitious economy there's no news, there's no external world, there's no exogenous shocks at all. It's just by the sheer dynamics of the model that, that these spikes here. And you know, for a while we thought that there must be a bug in the, in, in, in the code because this we didn't understand where these spikes were coming from. And so I, I see that time is flying, so I'm going to 
very quick on that. Then we realized by really thinking hard about what was going on, checking the code and making a model of the model. So we actually, I'm not even going to try to explain, but you can read in the paper. We, we came up with a, a simplified model of this agent based model, which is able to produce this quasi periodic appearance of, uh, of crisis. And, and the, the mechanism is really the one that I alluded to. There's a default of a farm. So there's an increased level of an unemployment and therefore decreased consumption uh, budget. So it fragilizes other firms, which leads to more defaults, but was not trivial at all. And it's actually related to my story of uh, neurons and fireflies at the beginning is that these uh, defaults can actually synchronize and lead to waves of, of defaults and, and business cycle as economists would, would call them. Okay, so we've adapted this model to mark zero, but I think uh, to uh, the COVID crisis and trying to understand whether the economy would have a V-shaped recovery or an L-shaped recovery. And I'll, I'll skip that because it's going to be too long. But uh, so let me conclude. Um, I've tried to convince you that um, uh, collective effects were extremely important to understand and that simulation and the and agent based models is, in my view, maybe not the only future, but uh, at least uh, an important part of the future of economic science, that agent based models and simulations are fantastic scenario generators, you can do virtual policy experiments, and it catalyzes your imagination, it forces you to understand things that are not obvious to start with, in particular, the presence of phase transitions of tipping points of collective behavior of uh, endogenous crisis with without 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 apparent causes and um and all these things are something that physicists are well trained to do emerging phenomena are well known to physics to physicists but uh, economic models only start to integrate these ideas in their uh, in their newest version and, and just to conclude on the importance of having qualitative scenarios uh, right rather than precise numbers out of models that don't mean anything, I want to quote one of my hero, uh, Keynes, who said, uh, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. So it, it's better to have a model that gives you roughly the right answer rather than a model that is supposed to give you precise numbers that are that is based on things that are completely wrong. And on that, I'm going to end and thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful presentation. So we haven't got uh, any question. Uh, so as the video will stay remain in Facebook and YouTube. So if I'll got a question uh, later, and uh, then I'll inform you. So thanks again. Okay. Uh, we'll thank you. So we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pavna University of Science and Technology, sir, for accepting our invitation. Have a nice day. Goodbye.